I'm, I'm booked through January. Um, still on SpongeBob SquarePants three, which I can't talk about um, at all. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Fierce and Flawless, The Female Project. I am Dr. Antonella Kaler and I am on a mission to find out exactly what it takes to build an indestructible foundation and achieve our best reality. I am thrilled to bring you stories of inspiring women who were fierce and relentless when pursuing their passions, who did not blame their struggles on so-called character flaws, and who took control to lead extraordinary lives. If you're a woman who is tired of feeling like your life is merely a product of cause and effect, and you are ready to be the woman that causes the effect, keep listening to learn the necessary insights to navigate life's toughest challenges, break through the most disheartening plateaus, and unleash your inner alpha woman. Hello, alphas, and welcome to another episode of Fierce and Flawless, The Female Project. Today, I am doing a Valentine's edition episode, and I have an amazing interview today with Hollywood costume designer Shauna Tripsick. So if you're a fan of Firefly, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, or Cabin in the Woods, Shauna was that universe's costume designer. So why is this a Valentine's Day episode, you ask? Well, Firefly will always have a special place in my heart as that was a shared interest that sparked romance when my husband and I just started dating. Uh, we still do as a tradition to watch an episode or two or just binge the whole thing in the Valentine's season. But I digress. Shauna and I talk about Hollywood, the pressures and the freedoms of creating fashion for other worlds, some of her biggest inspirations, her personal signature, and how to develop a skill to blend multiple styles into a stunning wardrobe. So enjoy this amazing episode for the true alpha woman. Shauna Tripps. Hi, Shauna. How are you? Very good. Thank you. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. I really appreciate it. I am a huge fan of you and of your work. And I'm trying to sound all cool, calm and collected. But on the inside, I'm kind of going a little e. <laughs> 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 well, thank you again for taking the time. So let's talk costume design. Costume design is just such an incredible field. I mean, it creates a whole universe for us. It's a subtext, subplot within the actual plot that just allows us as the viewers to be transformed. Now, did you always know that you wanted to be a costume designer or was there an aha moment <laughs> that you decided that that's what you were going to do? Or was it a little bit of a convoluted path to get there? Yeah, so um, in, in high school, I really wanted to join the Army and be a mechanic. I loved working with my hands and building machines and building car models. But I had an art teacher in high school who thought I had something that would propel me into a different direction. So he um, invited me to join the advanced placement art, uh, art class and um, found that whatever he showed me how to do, I could I could just focus until I got it right. So he asked if I would be open to going to an art college. And mm -hmm. I said, well, I don't have any money. I, I had no interest in going to college. And he says, well, let's gather your work and I'll help you fill out all the paperwork. And um, we'll submit for scholarships to Art Center in Pasadena and to Otis in Los Angeles. And we submitted to both and both uh, gave me scholarships for the summer. And I went to both and I ended up going to Otis. So um, once I enrolled in Otis, um, I just thought I was going to be a fine artist and my art teacher once again interceded and he said, well, you always draw the figure and how about your second year you start to focus on fashion? And and I'm a jeans and a t-shirt kind of gal. I shopped only at army surplus stores and I loved it. I loved that style. I loved the uniformity. I loved everything about it. But so when I entered into the fashion department, I was a bit lost for, for about a year. And um, But I would stay after school and I would you know, you know know do my best to... Um, emulate those best in my class that were put up on the walls to inspire us all. And by my senior year, I had worked for a fashion designer and it was so nine to five. It was winter, spring, summer, fall, holiday. And I was like, mm -hmm. this isn't me at all. This isn't what I want to do at all. And I had always drawn my model in, in college on black women, never on, on white women. And I was the only one who did that. And so I was never considered the best in the class because again, I had never even heard of Chanel or Dior or any of those designers. So I, I had a bit of a learning curve. 
but I was the only one who knew how to draw black people. Mm-hmm. And so one of the characters that Bob Mackie had chosen for the final project was Cinderella's Ball in the 1960s was Princess Aphrodite. And so I was chosen to design and create Princess Aphrodite. And I was like, this, aha, is my moment. <laughs> what I really want to do, I want to design characters. I want to research the character. I want to find out where they're from. I want to find out were they rich or poor, um, what materials did they use, but also with a theatrical bent because this was a stage show. And it was, I just bloomed. That was it. All the fireworks exploded and I decided I wanted to go into costumes. Mm-hmm. And how does one do that exactly? How does somebody take something as complicated and nebulous, like a character or personality and distill it, well, into a wardrobe. Um, let, you know, let's just take a character that a lot of people are familiar with, like Anara. Um, you know, I was given, you know, just a few lines of description that she was a, con- a concubine. And, and, and so I researched um, concubine from Asian to Middle Eastern to American sex workers, you name it. I just, I, I looked into the the royalty using concubines and, and, and everything in between. And once I had a real historical foundation, then I began to build off of the actor and then I, I built off any other um, points of information that I could glean from Tim Minear and Joss. And he was sort of birthed out of historical reference on uh, concubines throughout history. Mm-hmm. And Anara's spectacular golden dress from the episode Shindig has an interesting backstory. Would you mind sharing that with us? Yeah. So the culture of East Indian uh, fabrics and style have always fascinated me. And when I was married, I myself and my bridesmaids all wore East Indian clothing. It was the my wedding dress was just sitting in storage, and and we couldn't find overly embroidered, beautiful silk fabric for this spectacular dress that she was supposed to walk in. So I thought, well, I have this wedding dress just sitting there. Let me, you know, recut it, refashion it, redesign it and make it her shindig dress. And so they actually, I think they said that she enters in wearing green or some other color, but I changed the script um, and I I recut the veil to make a bodice for her. And then I dyed silk to be her sleeve to match, you know, the, the fabric. And um, there were some issues. For some reason, my amazing seamstress and tailoring department uh, made it about four inches too small, so we couldn't uh, fasten the top uh, button. <laughs> and my amazing set girl, Cleo Manel, re-sewed it and refastened it within seconds. We never held camera. It was just gorgeous. And um, it ended up working out even better because it made sort of a V in the back that was, was quite beautiful. So, yes, and our shindig dress is my wedding dress. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, speaking of repurposing, does that happen? Can uh, costumes be used for completely different shows? Do uh, do wardrobes make cameos? Can an outfit make a cameo? Yes. Well, um, again, television is often a lower budget, quite quite lower than a film, and we only have eight days to prep a one-hour episode rather than like with a movie that's usually an hour and a half, you have four months prep. But we only have eight days prep. And during those eight days prep, you are also shooting. So you're on set doing fittings. A lot of a lot of what we have to do is repurpose things that we find in storage at the studio that we're working at. And we're working at, out of Fox. And in their storage was the medical jacket from Aliens. Mm-hmm. And I, it was funny because I didn't know that Josh had worked on Aliens. <laughs> yeah, Resurrection, right? Yeah. <laughs> So I repurposed this, this lab coat from Aliens for Simon. Later on, when, when the writer strike happened, again, very low budget, very short prep time. I think we only had two days. Um, for Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog, I repurposed that lab coat for the third time. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. So they do, they do uh, make appearances across different shows then. That's awesome. Now, uh, do you have a signature or a little emblem or any little Easter egg for those uh, fans who know your work as a little uh, sign of recognition of, oh, there's a, a piece of your work that we're looking at? Yeah, so um, with uh, uh, costume designers are starting to get more recognition, but still we're kind of, you know, very behind the scenes and behind the camera. So I thought I would do a little hit, hidden signature on mm-hmm. um every work that I do, whether it be television or film. So I, and this was actually uh, Cleo's idea too, Cleo Manel. I used the bingo on Badger on, on his lapel and she had kept 
that King Flamingo. And when we worked together again, I think on Dr. Horrible, she's like, look, you know, we have this Pink Flamingo. We could use it again. Or no, it was on Dollhouse. So we used the Pink Flamingo again on Dollhouse on Topher's assistant. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be my signature. I'm going to try to fit a Pink Flamingo in some sort of way, whether it be on a tie or a sweatshirt or a shoe or a button. I'm going to work in Pink Flamingo on everything I do as a kind of Easter egg who's who wears Waldo. And we've been able to do it on just about everything. My my assistants often have to remind me, don't forget the Pink Flamingo. <laughs> because it's like, that's part of the, they're, they're, that's part of their game too. And um, this year, it was kind of fun. Um, forgive the little boxes that uh, the brown coat people put out. Shoot, I'm blanking. Um, oh, the loot crates. Yeah, loot, loot crate. Thank you so much. So in the loot crate, they had a, a replica of the pink flamingo. So I decided I would use their replica pink flamingo in SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> so if there's ever a trivia question of what do SpongeBob and Badger from Firefly have in common, the answer is going to be pink flamingo. Look, look for the lapel because it's the, it's the same King Flamingo in the same placement. <laughs> now, what is it like seeing other people put together replicas of your work and wear them at Comic-Con? Or have you ever seen any really interesting mashups or interesting twists on your work that uh, you found intriguing? Yeah, I wish I could remember what it was a, a hybrid mix of, but it, it, it was like Kaylee, but, you know, it was her shindig, but it was also something dig. I don't know. They... They mixed a couple of different characters. It was, it was, it was amazing. But I got to tell you, I, I went to a um, Jane Hat Flash. That, like I saw it, it was trending on Twitter. And I was like, oh, I, I'm, I'm just going to show up there. And they, they didn't know I was there. They didn't know who I was. And, and I was just part of the group that was just watching them. And they like sprung out in the song, A Man Called Jane. And I literally started tearing up. I'm like, oh my gosh, all these guys are wearing this hat based on the loving, you know, little slippers that my grandmother used to knit me because that was my inspiration for his hat. And actually, I was gonna, it was going to be slippers based on my grandmother's slippers that she made me. But Josh was like, no, he's got to put it on the scene. Mm-hmm. So I changed it to the hat, um, the thrilling heroic um, pattern for the hat. <laughs> That's amazing. You're, you're the rock star. Yeah, yes. So I, I literally cheered up. And, and, and honestly, every time I go do, uh, what has it been, what, 10, 15 years? Oh, my gosh. 15 years ago. Every, for 15 years, I've been going to Comic-Con. And I still see a Firefly. And I and I, I love it every time. I I, I love it every time. <laughs> of course, us Firefly fans love it to the bitter end. Now I'm sure everybody's pestering you, but yeah, it looks like all hope is lost, and it's uh, not going to be coming back. Yeah, that ship has sailed. Yeah. Now, uh, speaking of uh, Kaylee's layer cake dress, we have a question from Valerie Annabelle Rickard from Darby, Montana. What inspired you to do that dress design? Um, well, again, I, I, I always build my foundation in historical references. And I was just flipping through many of the historical books and magazines and papers that were down in the dungeon of Fox Research. <laughs> and I came across this picture of a girl with very, like, all those sort of little layers. And she was kind of slunched over her hands and her head kind of slunched in between this giant hoop skirt and just ruffles everywhere, looking exhausted but childlike. And I'm like, that. Hey Lee. <laughs> and so I did up a drawing and um and again I went to the East Indian fabrics uh, for her bodice and then all the silks below were, were dyed. But I did this uh, quick sketch for Joss and Tim Minear and, and they loved it. They're like, Yes, that's her and it was it was capturing that childlike essence of just flopping in this giant dress and just being a, still a tomboy and completely hundred percent herself, wonderful layers. So it was it was a historical image. It was just a pencil drawing from some old newspaper. <laughs> and it worked. It was such pure fufura perfection for Kaylee. It was wonderful. But my favorite outfit actually in the entire series, my favorite costume, ironically, is not one of the many gorgeous, gorgeous dresses, but it is actually Jubal Early's The Bounty Hunters. Just fantastic, creative badass space outfit and it was so so unique and so well done i was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that one yeah so um so i love sci-fi i've always loved sci-fi and this was you know i was able to actually design and make the spacesuit whereas the other uh, spacesuits i was able to rent them and then we just designed the helmets to to go with them but um but his was designed head to toe and this was before all the superhero movies and all these all these problems had been solved. And so I built it out of leather. And, mm-hmm. you know, now we built everything out of, you know, amazing fabrics that we 3D print. And, those, you know, it's, it's a much 
much more streamlined process, a lot easier. But um, but back then, that, that wasn't a thing. So my drawing, I thought, would lend itself only to leather. And so we went to a shoe guy um, in, on Melrose who built it for us, again, because of time and budget. And it fit. It fit the actor beautifully, but the problem was um, we put it on the stunt guy and we said, okay, do a movement so that um, – so that we can, you know, see how it moves. And he did one very slow movement and literally hulked out of the whole back end of the suit. It seemed poor. And he was to be on camera in like seven minutes. So again, Cleo Manel, she took a bunch of um, scraps of spandex, but a thicker spandex, I'm just blanking on the name, but the spandex and, and put it in, into all the scenes that he had hulked out of. So now all those the pressure points would move. And so it came out beautifully. So he, the stuntman was able to, you know, jump from the ceiling and, you know, have fights and do everything that he could do. Um, but that was a learning curve and it was a, a labor of love and it was, it was such a joy to do. And he is one of my favorite characters. That actor is just brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely. And Object in Space has to be my favorite episode tied closely together with Janestown and Shindig and Heart of Gold. Who am I kidding? I love them all. <laughs> but I digress. Uh, of course, no discussion would be complete without talking about Miles' uh, brown coat. So if you could tell us a little bit about how that came to be. And we had a poll and people want to know, where can they get a high quality replica? Okay, well, Jill O'Hanistan is the costume designer who did the pilot mm-hmm. and the um, first couple episodes. And I was her assistant costume designer on the pilot the first couple episodes. And so we did a lot of research of the Civil War and, um, and just pioneers and settlers. And so the, the three-quarter length cut is, is very much inspired by the Civil War. And the leather was a lamb, a lamb suede uh, to give that sort of soft movement and to help us age it uh, easier. And then the, the, the clips, the closings were found at, um, at Johnson Logan's, but I mean, he didn't have them. He directed us to a place that did have them. And I forget the name of the fastener place, but it's it's gone out of business. But so the only, the person that I know who makes, the replicas was obviously Jonathan Logan. He's still in business. He's still making gorgeous leathers. I think he just finished the Billy Idol leather jacket. This blew me away. Um, you know, so he knows the lambskin. He knows that he has the pattern. He ha- he knows the, the the fasteners. He may even have a couple of the originals left. I'm not sure, but um, but I know that um, I thought Think Geek or somebody like that did um did another replica but i've never seen one of those in person so i can't mm-hmm. vouch for you know their quality or anything but um but yeah so it was influenced by the civil war and by settlers and um and just through a progress uh, um a progression of fittings uh, we figured it out with jonathan what was best fit on on Mason. Amazing. How exciting. And it's it's so wonderful. I mean, you're unbelievably talented, but it's so clear that you're so passionate and that you love what you do. There's people that would kill to do what you do now. Uh, do you have any advice that you're willing to share with uh, anybody like that for people who are maybe thinking about pursuing your line of work or something similar? Yeah, c- certainly. So when I, um, in my senior year of college, I walked or I drove down to the American Film Institute, which is the school that teaches directors and producers and, you know, and such how to make movies. Well, I asked, they don't have costume designers there, obviously, so I asked them if I could design their student films. So, and there's a film school at UCLA, there's a film school at USC, these are all California colleges, but there's film schools at many colleges, and they're usually in need of a costume designer, and, you know, you work for free for the first couple of years, or, you know, for credits, or whatever, and I know that that's very hard these days, mm-hmm. because of the economy. Um, I was able to kind of live off of Top Ramen and very low rent in downtown LA, and, and, and make Nick do, and I would work every holiday and every day off at Nordstrom's Rack or Nordstrom's <laughs> selling them furnishings. You know, so I made it work, working for very, very little. But one thing I would warn anybody going into the film business um, or any business that's, um, you know, a temporary job and then you move on to the next is that you think that you're making these long lasting relationships and friendships. And when I was first starting out, it's like, wow, this is a real family. They really love me. You know, this is great. But then the movie would end and you would never hear from anybody again. And things like that can, can really mess with your sense of worth and your sense of being. 
because you think all these people are your friends, but we're all just trying to get to the next job and make a living. Mm -hmm. So the film industry can be very hard in that you don't get to build up long lasting relationships. I mean, you do as you work longer and longer. Um, I have people that I work with over and over again that I consider very close friends, but that takes a while. So it's a very isolated career choice, very isolated business as you start out because you are literally just saying yes to any job you can get. I was on location for six to 10 months a year. You know, you're separated from family. You can't really have pets when you're starting out. It's like, it's, it's very isolating. So that would be my one big warning, but my one big encouragement, um, I'm very happy, (laughs) you know, and, and I think that, you know, part of that spirituality, but it's also pursuing what you love and not giving up on your dream. If you love working with fabrics and if you love doing costumes, you know, find a small theater that you can do it on the weekends. Find a college that has theater or film schools and and do what you love, do what you dream and see where it goes. When the people at American Film Institute graduated, they remembered me working for them for free and they hired me for real films. And I started out very low and then I eventually joined the union after I designed Power Rangers. And then that led to me, me being an assistant on Bugsy and Toys and all these wonderful films that were nominated for Academy Awards. And then eventually um, on Firefly, I was able to go back to being the head designer and I've been you know, doing that ever since. So my, my best encouragement is, you know, you just don't, let go of the miracle. Just don't give up on your dream. And um, even if you have to work 10 other jobs, you know, make it work. And it, it, it all works out in the end. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much for that insight. Now, do you have any projects that are coming up that you're particularly excited about? Well, uh, again, with, 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 with my job, it's like I literally don't know what I'm doing for the next. <laughs> the next. So right, right now, um, I'm booked through January. Um, still on Spongebob Squarepants 3, which I can't talk about um, at all. <laughs> so a lot of fun that is. But, um, but suffice to say, you know, what, what a joy, uh, you know, working on a show that's, you know, 90% animated and then has seven minutes of live action and you just get to shine, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> really play with colors and textures. And I'm like, wow, this is so much fun. Um, so I'm doing that right now. And then, um, you know, you hear whispers of the wind, what might be next, but until you sign the contract, you just don't know. So that's all I can share. (laughs) Well, I can't wait. It sounds so fun. And of course, we're all going to be on the lookout for those pink flamingos. Can't wait to see it. Uh, now as we're wrapping up, I do pester all of my guests about a book, a book that has had a profound impact on yourself or just any book that you would recommend our audience should read. Yeah, well, so I, I read at the top of every year a book called Creative Visualization. Mm-hmm. Creative Visualization. I can't even say the word, but it's by Shakti Gawain. So G-A-W-A-I-N is the mm-hmm. last name. It's called Creative Visualization. It's a small book, extremely powerful, and I think extremely important to um, to really latching on to your dreams and visualizing what you need to do to accomplish them and seeing yourself there. It's uh, it's just a brilliant book. And I'm, and I'm also reading uh, Michelle Obama's Becoming, which again, for me, has been very inspirational of just believing in yourself, no matter your circumstances or your surroundings, and never using people, place, or things as crutches uh, or excuses on why you can't accomplish your dreams. It's you know, I grew up extremely poor. I never knew I was extremely poor <laughs> and even homeless for a while because I had the most amazing mother who just, I, didn't, I never knew. Um, I loved shopping at some army surplus stores. But, you know, it, it's very easy as we get older to, you know, point the finger at people, places, or things on why we can make an excuse for, for our, our upbringing. And, and I love the way Michelle Obama spins everything in a positive light. And, and, you know, her, her struggles with race and her struggles with poverty, it never seems like something is an excuse. Every single thing she sees is a step to raise, to rise higher. And I, so I'm enjoying that right now. Yeah, what a truly wonderful book. Thank you so much for those suggestions. Now, as we're wrapping up, any final words that you would like to share with uh, the audience or with your fans? Oh, well, sure. Um, I just want to say how much I love all of you guys. I I love the fan base of the Mutant Enemy family. You know, what's my work on Angel, Dr. Horrible, 
cabin in the woods, whatever I do in the in the mutant enemy, Joss Whedon, brown coat world, uh, every single fan that's come up to me, every single fan that I've met, every single fan that I've exchanged with on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, I I find enriching in every way and and lesson learning in every way. And I'm just so, so grateful for all of you. So thank you. And thank you so much for your incredible work for bringing these worlds to life. And of course, thank you so much for talking to us, for coming on to the show and letting our audience get a little sneak peek of what goes on behind the scenes of our favorite shows. Great. Thank you so much. It was was very nice to virtually meet you. (laughs) You as well. Thank you so much, Shauna. Hey Alphas, it's Dr. Antonella from Fierce and Flawless, The Female Project. I cannot wait to bring you more incredible stories and exceptional insights from women who made an impact. So join me on this journey. Subscribe and comment with nominations for guests you would like featured next. I want to deliver content that ignites a spark in you. So your feedback is extremely important to me. To connect with me and to get the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.thefemaleproject.net or add me on Instagram at dr.antonella. Thank you for listening and stay tuned.